Hail our people, hail victory! I think we're in a particularly dire moment. We're going through a crisis that's predicated, for the most part, on race. This is not an issue that's going away. I'm Maurice Berger, and I'm a cultural historian. I write the monthly race story series for the Lens blog of the New York Times. I'm very interested in writing about the things that would normally not be written about. It's like issues of race that people are uncomfortable with. My childhood was really informative about the way I see and understand race in America. I didn't grow up like most of my white friends. I grew up in a predominantly black and Puerto Rican low-income housing project on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. The racism that I witnessed left me realizing that nothing really quite compared to that in terms of the experience of prejudice. I was lucky in the sense that my white skin protected me from that. I loved my friends and I saw how much pain it caused. That inspires and informs my view of photography because I realized at a very young age that race was also a very visual thing. The color of your skin can make a whole lot of difference. I think my essay on Charlottesville may have been one of the more provocative ones in terms of asking my readers to take a little walk with me into self-awareness. The virulent bigot may not be the redneck with the Confederate flag flying on their barn. The virulent bigot may be the guy who's dating your daughter. Or the virulent bigot may be the person who works next to you. The ordinariness of racism hasn't changed really at all for a really long time. The most telling parallel to the photographs in Charlottesville in the context of the United States were photographs of lynchings. Do you look at the people milling around? They're also ordinary folks. They're also the farmer and the dentist and the storekeeper. They're just these white folks, right? And yet they've just murdered someone without remorse. Because the essay was about the ordinariness of racism and the everydayness of it, I was actually asking my readers not just to say, look at those bad white supremacists with the tiki torches, as ridiculous as those pictures were, but to also start to think about their own stuff. Some of the greatest damage done in the name of racism is not really done by white supremacists. It's in the everyday interactions of people. Even in the most liberal places like San Francisco and New York City and Boston, the slights, the microaggressions, the subtle dismissals, the fearful behavior. You see a little bit of that in the Americans. Robert Frank's image of a black couple startled on a hill in San Francisco. What is that telling you? Photographs are all about focusing. They're all about details stilled to one moment. And sometimes, if you capture the right moment, that story, that image, is more valuable than as many words as you could summon. It's why Frederick Douglass was the most photographed American of the 19th century. It's why the great leader and intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois curated an exhibition on the portrait. The camera could be used, not just to sway white people's opinion, that was maybe secondary, but to allow African Americans who were under the gaze of a mainstream culture that either ignored them, denigrated them, or subjected them to all manner of stereotypes to represent themselves as they wanted to be seen. 
I think one of the great photographers of the 20th century, without doubt for me, is Gordon Parks. And the one thing that Gordon understood was that photography was a medium of inspiration. Gordon believed that if white Americans held stereotypical views of black Americans, what would it mean to take photographs of black people that instead of the differences that fuel their racism and fuel their stereotypes, there were mostly similarities. A couple reading the newspaper while their daughter was doing her homework on the floor of their living room, at the barber shop, or taking her child to the movies. And what Gordon felt very strongly was that images like that could inspire something that was not all that common in American life in the middle of the 20th century, and that was empathy. That it could undermine the very concept of difference that drives the motor of racism and segregation and bigotry by disarming the idea of difference itself. I shouldn't, you know, photographs are like children. When you write about them, you shouldn't pick your favorites. But for me, one of the great, one of the truly, one of the most extraordinary photographs, a photograph that every time I look at it, I have, I just, my adrenaline rushes, I get a tear in my eye. I just can't believe how beautiful and brilliant this photograph is of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an aunt standing with her young niece in front of a, the colored entrance of a movie theater. The woman is Joanne Wilson. I interviewed Joanne Wilson 50 years later after the photograph was taken in Alabama. They're in their Sunday best, of course. You have to be in your Sunday best in a world that demeans you. You want to show that world you're not who they say you are. The little girl wanted popcorn. She could smell the popcorn. But no way was Mrs. Wilson going to walk that child through the back door of that theater. And I asked Mrs. Wilson, is there anything about the photograph you don't like? She said, well, the strap of my slip was showing. And to me, that strap is the strap of a woman preoccupied with a little child. She's not thinking she's in Vogue magazine at that moment. She's thinking of that child. And that's what every mother does. Every aunt does. Every grandmother does when they're with a child. The great Gordon Parks, with that camera in his hand, allowing this school teacher and her niece to somehow walk into history. That photograph is the ultimate. Nothing gives me great joy than writing about young photographers like Latoya Ruby Frazier and Nona Faustine. To hear Nona talk about Gordon Parks, I too use the camera as a weapon of choice. To see this beautiful transference of the power of the camera from generation to generation is to me one of the most beautiful and energizing things to watch. When Nona photographs her mother or her child, she's also sending a message about anyone else's mother or anyone else's child, which is that we're worth photographing, we're worth being represented that representing us can be a powerful act. Nona is saying that it's possible to photograph your world and make something extraordinary of it, make something meaningful of it, make something very moving. It's the work of a photographer who is deeply committed to looking at the issue of the personal as a window onto the historical. I think, for example, of Latoya Ruby Frazier's photographs. The photograph she took of her own family in Braddock, Pennsylvania, tell both a personal story and a story as big as the world itself about the reality of neglect, the reality of gentrification, the reality of dying towns, the reality of what it means when we lose that more cosmic notion of family. Most Americans don't talk about the other. You know, it's gonna be through Maurice's essays 
where history is going to show that there was a collective of African-American photographers and artists that really care about the history of this country, the history of our culture, and how we are moving forward and being shaped. And I think he sets the example and the tone that if more Americans were able to comfortably talk about the elephant in the room, we would be a more equal and just society and civilization. The problem of racism is not over. In some ways, it's much worse because people think it's over. I see my New York Times pieces as exercises in pedagogy. How do you teach the reader racial literacy through visual literacy? And maybe in reading what I have to say, inspiring a person to think, how can I change? How can I change my attitudes? What am I doing that's hurting someone else? and also to let my readers of color know that they are being heard, that their images matter in a mainstream culture where their images still don't matter as much as they should, that there's brilliance and beauty and profundity. It's all out there. And if the visual culture that you're living with doesn't reflect it enough, at least in this tiny little way, we'll reflect it at lens.